Politics by Ralph Waldo Emerson from Essays Second Series, 1844. Gold and iron are good to buy iron and gold. All earth's fleece and food for their like are sold. Voted Merlin wise, proved Napoleon great. Nor kind nor coinage buys aught above its rate. Fear, craft, and avarice cannot rear a state out of dust to build what is more than dust, walls amphion piled. Phoebus established must, when the muses dine with the virtues meet, find to their design an Atlantic seat, by green archered bows fended from the heat, where the statesman ploughs furrow for the wheat. When the church is social worth, when the state house is the hearth, then the perfect state is come, the Republican at home. In dealing with the state, we ought to remember that its institutions are not aboriginal, though they existed before we were born, that they are not superior to the citizen, that every one of them was once the act of a single man, every law and usage was a man's expedient to meet a particular case, that they all are imitable, all alterable, we may make as good, we may make better. Society is an illusion to the young citizen. It lies before him in rigid repose, with certain names, men, and institutions rooted like oak trees to the center, round which all arrange themselves the best they can. But the old statesman knows that society is fluid. There are no such roots and centers, but any particle may suddenly become the center of the movement and compel the system to gyrate round it, as every man of strong will, like Pisistratus or Cromwell, does for a time, and every man of truth, like Plato or Paul, does for ever. But politics rest on necessary foundations, and cannot be treated with levity. Republics abound in young civilians who believe that the laws make the city, that grave modifications of the policy and modes of living and employments of the population, that commerce, education, and religion may be voted in or out, and that any measure, though it were absurd, may be imposed on a people, if only you can get sufficient voices to make it a law. But the wise know that foolish legislation is a rope of sand, which perishes in the twisting, that the state must follow and not lead the character and progress of the citizen. The strongest usurper is quickly got rid of, and they only who build on ideas build for eternity, and that the form of government which prevails is the expression of what cultivation exists in the population which permits it. The law is only a memorandum. We are superstitious and esteem the statute somewhat. So much life as it has in the character of living men is its force. The statute stands there to say, Yesterday we agreed so and so, but how feel ye this article today? Our statute is a currency which we stamp with our own portrait. It soon becomes unrecognizable, and in process of time will return to the mint. Nature is not democratic, nor limited monarchical, but despotic, and will not be fooled or abated of any jot of her authority by the protest of her sons, and as fast as the public mind is open to more intelligence, the code is seen to be brute and stammering. It speaks not articulately, and must be made to. Meantime, the education of the general mind never stops. The reveries of the true and simple are prophetic. What the tender poetic youth dreams and prays and paints today, but shuns the ridicule of saying aloud, shall presently be the resolutions of public bodies, then shall be carried as grievance and bill of rights through conflict and war, and then shall be triumphant law and establishment for a hundred years, until it gives place, in turn, to new prayers and pictures. The history of the state sketches in coarse outline the progress of thought, and follows at a distance the delicacy of culture and of aspiration. The theory of politics, which has possessed the mind of men, and which they have expressed the best they could in their laws and in their revolutions, considers persons and property as the two objects for whose protection government exists. 
of persons all have equal rights in virtue of being identical in nature this interest of course with its whole power demands a democracy whilst the rights of all as persons are equal in virtue of their access to reason their rights in property are very unequal one man owns his clothes and another owns a county this accident depending primarily on the skill and virtue of the parties of which there is every degree and secondarily on patrimony falls unequally and its rights of course are unequal personal rights universally the same demand a government framed on the ratio of the census property demands a government framed on the ratio of owners and of owning laban who has flocks and herds wishes them looked after by an officer on the frontiers lest the midianites shall drive them off and pays a tax to that end jacob has no flocks or herds <coughs> and no fear of the midianites and pays no tax to the officer it seemed fit that laban and jacob should have equal rights to elect the officer who is to defend their persons but that laban and not jacob should elect the officer who is to guard the sheep and cattle and if question arise whether additional officers or watchtowers should be provided must not laban and isaac and those who must sell part of their herds to buy protection for the rest judge better of this and with more right than jacob who because he is a youth and a traveller eats their bread and not his own in the earliest society the proprietors made their own wealth and so long as it comes to the owners in the direct way no other opinion would arise in any equitable community than that property should make the law for property and persons the law for persons but property passes through donation or inheritance to those who do not create it gift in one case makes it as really the new owners as labor made it the first owners in the other case of patrimony the law makes an ownership which will be valid in each man's view according to the estimate which he sets on the public tranquillity it was not however found easy to embody the readily admitted principle that property should make law for property and persons for persons since persons and property mix themselves in every transaction at last it seemed settled that the rightful distinction was that the proprietors should have more elective franchise than non-proprietors on the spartan principle of calling that which is just equal not that which is equal just that principle no longer looks so self-evident as it appeared in former times partly because doubts have arisen whether too much weight had not been allowed in the laws to property and such a structure given to our usages as allowed the rich to encroach on the poor and to keep them poor but mainly because there is an instinctive sense however obscure and yet inarticulate that the whole constitution of property on its present tenures is injurious and its influence on persons deteriorating and degrading that truly only the only interest for the consideration of the state is persons that property will always follow persons that the highest end of government is the culture of men and if men can be educated the institutions will share their improvement and the moral sentiment will write the law of the land if it be not easy to settle the equity of this question the peril is less when we take note of our natural defences we are kept by better guards than the vigilance of such magistrates as we commonly elect society always consists in greatest part of young and foolish persons the old who have seen through the hypocrisy of courts and statesmen die and leave no wisdom to their sons they believe their own newspaper as their fathers did at their age with such an ignorant and deceivable majority states would soon run to ruin but that there are limitations beyond which the folly and ambition of governors cannot go things have their laws as well as men and things refuse to be trifled with property will be protected corn will not grow unless it is planted and manured but the farmer will not plant or hoe it unless the chances are a hundred to one that he will cut and harvest it under any forms persons and property must and will have their just sway they exert their power as steadily as matter its attraction 
cover up a pound of earth never so cunningly, divide and subdivide it, melt it to liquid, convert it to gas, it will always weigh a pound. It will always attract and resist other matter by the full virtue of one pound weight. And the attributes of a person, his wit and his moral energy, will exercise under any law or extinguishing tyranny their proper force, if not overtly, then covertly, if not for the law, then against it, with right or by might. The boundaries of personal influence it is impossible to fix. As persons are organs of moral or supernatural force, under the dominion of an idea which possesses the minds of multitudes as civil freedom or the religious sentiment, the powers of persons are no longer subjects of calculation. A nation of men unanimously bent on freedom or conquest can easily confound the arithmetic of status and achieve extravagant actions out of all proportion to their means, as the Greeks, the Saracens, the Swiss, the Americans, and the French have done. In like manner, to every particle of property belongs its own attraction. A cent is the representative of a certain quantity of corn or other commodity. Its value is in the necessities of the animal man. It is so much warmth, so much bread, so much water, so much land. The law may do what it will with the owner of property. Its just power will still attach to the cent. The law may, in a mad freak, say that all shall have power except the owners of property. They say they shall have no vote. Nevertheless, by a higher law, the property will, year after year, write every statute that respects property. The non-proprietor will be the scribe of the proprietor. What the owners wish to do, the whole power of property will do, either through the law or else in defiance of it. Of course, I speak of all the property not merely of the great estates. When the rich are outvoted, as frequently happens, it is the joint treasury of the poor which exceeds their accumulations. Every man owns something, if it is only a cow, or a wheelbarrow, or his arms, and so has that property to dispose of. The same necessity which secures the rights of person and property against the malignity or folly of the magistrate determines the form and methods of governing, which are proper to each nation, and to its habit of thought, and nowise transferable to other states of society. In this country we are very vain of our political institutions, which are singular in this, that they sprung, within the memory of living men, from the character and condition of the people, which they still express with sufficient fidelity, and we ostentatiously prefer them to any other in history. They are not better, but only fitter for us." We may be wise in asserting the advantage in modern times of the democratic form, but to other states of society in which religion consecrated the monarchical, that and not this was expedient. Democracy is better for us because the religious sentiment of the present time accords better with it. Born Democrats, we are no wise qualified to judge of monarchy, which to our fathers living in the monarchical idea was also relatively right. But our institutions, though in coincidence with the spirit of the age, have not any exemption from the practical defects which have discredited other forms. Every actual state is corrupt. Good men must not obey the laws too well. What satire on government can equal the severity of censure conveyed in the world word <clears throat> politic which now for ages has signified cunning, intimating that the state is a trick. The same benign necessity and the same practical abuse appear in the parties into which each state divides itself, of opponents and defenders of the administration of the government. Parties are also founded on instincts and have better guides to their own humble aims than the sagacity of their leaders. They have nothing perverse in their origin, but rudely mark some real and lasting relation. We might as wisely reprove the east wind or the frost as a political party whose members, for the most part, could give no account of their position, but stand for the defense of those interests in which they find themselves. Our quarrel with them begins when they quit this deep natural ground at the bidding of some leader 
and, obeying personal considerations, throw themselves into the maintenance and defense of points nowise belonging to their system. A party is perpetually corrupted by personality. Whilst we absolve the association from dishonesty, we cannot extend the same charity to their leaders. They reap the rewards of the docility and zeal of the masses which they direct. Ordinarily, our parties are parties of circumstance, and not of principle, as the planting interest in conflict with the commercial, the party of capitalists and that of operatives, parties which are identical in their moral character, and which can easily change ground with each other in the support of many of their measures. Parties of principle, as religious sects, or the party of free trade, of universal suffrage, of abolition of slavery, of abolition of capital punishment, degenerate into personalities, or would inspire enthusiasm. The vice of our leading parties in this country, which may be cited as a fair specimen of these societies of opinion, is that they do not plant themselves on the deep and necessary grounds to which they are respectively entitled, but lash themselves to fury in the carrying of some local and momentary measure, nowise useful to the common wealth, of the two great parties which at this hour almost share the nation between them, I should say that one has the best cause and the other contains the best men. The philosopher, the poet, or the religious man will, of course, wish to cast his vote with the Democrat for free trade, for wide suffrage, for the abolition of legal cruelties in the penal code, and for facilitating in every manner the access of the young and the poor to the sources of wealth and power, but he can rarely accept the persons whom the so-called popular party proposed to him as representatives of these liberalities. <clears throat> they have not at heart the ends which give to the name of democracy, what hope and virtue are in it. The spirit of our American radicalism is destructive and aimless. It is not loving, it has no ulterior and divine ends, but is destructive only out of hatred and selfishness. On the other side, the conservative party, composed of the most moderate, able, and cultivated part of the population, is timid and merely defensive of property. It vindicates no right, it aspires to no real good, it brands no crime, it proposes no generous policy, it does not build, nor write, nor cherish the arts, nor foster religion, nor establish schools, nor encourage science, nor emancipate the slave, nor befriend the poor, or the Indian, or the immigrant. From neither party, when in power, has the world any benefit to expect in science, art, or humanity, at all commensurate with the resources of the nation. I do not for these defects despair of our republic. We are not at the mercy of any waves of chance. In the strife of ferocious parties, human nature always finds itself cherished, as the children of the convicts at Botany Bay are found to have as healthy a moral sentiment as other children. Citizens of feudal states are alarmed at our democratic institutions lapsing into anarchy, and the older and more cautious among ourselves are learning from Europeans to look with some terror at our turbulent freedom. It is said that in our license of construing the Constitution and in the despotism of public opinion, we have no anchor, and one foreign observer thinks he has found the safeguard in the sanctity of marriage among us, and another thinks he has found it in our Calvinism. Fisher Ames expressed the popular security more wisely when he compared a monarchy and a republic, saying that a monarchy is a merchant man which sails well, but will sometimes strike on a rock and go to the bottom, whilst a republic is a raft which would never sink, but then your feet are always in water. No forms can have any dangerous importance whilst we are befriended by the laws of things. It makes no difference how many tons weight of atmosphere presses on our heads, so long as the same pressure resists it within the lungs. Augment the mass a thousandfold, it cannot begin to crush us as long as reaction is equal to action. The fact of two poles, of two forces, centripetal and centrifugal, is universal, and each force by its own activity develops the other. 
wild liberty develops in iron conscience want of liberty by strengthening law and decorum stupefies conscience lynch law prevails only where there is a greater hardihood and self-subsistency in the leaders a mob cannot be a permanency everybody's interest requires that it should not exist and only justice satisfies all we must trust infinitely to the beneficent necessity which shines through all laws human nature expresses itself in them as characteristically as in statues or songs or railroads and an abstract of the codes of nations would be a transcript of the common conscience governments have their origin in the moral identity of men reason for one is seen to be reason for another and for every other there is a middle measure which satisfies all parties be they never so many or so resolute for their own every man finds a sanction for his simplest claims and deeds in decisions of his own mind which he calls truth and holiness in these decisions all the citizens find a perfect agreement and only in these not in what is good to eat good to wear good use of time or what amount of land or of public aid each is entitled to claim this truth and justice men presently endeavor to make public application of to the measuring of land the apportionment of service the protection of life and property their first endeavors no doubt are very awkward yet absolute right is the first governor or every government is an impure theocracy the idea after which each community is aiming to make and mend its law is the will of the wise man the wise man it cannot find in nature and it makes awkward but earnest efforts to secure his government by contrivance as by causing the entire people to give their voices on every measure or by a double choice to get the representation of the whole or by a selection of the best citizens or to secure the advantages of efficiency and eternal peace by confiding the government to one who may himself select his agents all forms of government symbolize an immortal government common to all dynasties and independent of numbers perfect where two men exist perfect where there is only one man every man's nature is a sufficient advertisement to him of the character of his fellows my right and my wrong is their right and their wrong whilst i do what is fit for me and abstain from what is unfit my neighbor and i shall often agree in our means and work together for a time to one end but whenever i find my dominion over myself not sufficient for me and undertake the direction of him also i overstep the truth and come into false relations to him i may have so much more skill or strength than he that he cannot express adequately his sense of wrong but it is a lie and hurts like a lie both him and me love and nature cannot maintain the assumption it must be executed by a practical lie namely by force this undertaking for another is the blunder which stands in colossal ugliness in the governments of the world it is the same thing in numbers as in a pair only not quite so intelligible i can see well enough a great difference between my settling myself down to a self-control and my going to make somebody else act after my views but when a quarter of the human race assume to tell me what i must do i may be too much disturbed by the circumstance to see so clearly the absurdity of their command therefore all public ends look vague and quixotic beside private ones for any laws but those which men make for themselves are laughable if i put myself in the place of my child and we stand in one thought and see that things are thus or thus that perception is law for him and me we are both there both act but if without carrying him into the thought i look over into his plot and guessing how it is with him ordain this or that he will never obey me this is the history of governments one man does something which is to bind another a man who cannot be acquainted with me taxes me looking from afar at me ordains that a part of my labor shall go to this or that whimsical end not as i but as he happens to fancy 
behold the consequence of all debts men are least willing to pay the taxes what a satire is this on government everywhere they think they get their money's worth except for these hence the less government we have the better the fewer laws and the less confided power the antidote to this abuse of formal government is the influence of private character the growth of the individual the appearance of the principle to supersede the proxy the appearance of the wise man of whom the existing government is it must be owned but a shabby imitation that which all things tend to reduce which freedom cultivation intercourse revolutions go to form and deliver is character that is the end of nature to reach unto this coronation of her king to educate the wise man the state exists and with the appearance of the wise man the state expires the appearance of character makes the state unnecessary the wise man is the state he needs no army fort or navy he loves men too well no bribe or feast or palace to draw friends to him no vantage ground no favorable circumstance he needs no library for he has not done thinking no church for he is a prophet no statute book for he has the lawgiver no money for he is value no road for he is at home where he is no experience for the life of the creator shoots through him and looks from his eyes he has no personal friends for he who has the spell to draw the prayer and piety of all men unto him needs not husband and educate a few to share with him a select and poetic life his relation to men is angelic his memory is myrrh to them his pr presence frankincense and flowers we think our civilization near its meridian but we are yet only at the cock crowing and the morning star in our barbarous society the influence of character is in its infancy as a political power as the rightful lord who is to tumble all rulers from their chairs its presence is hardly yet suspected malthus and ricardo quite omit it the annual register is silent in the conversation's lexicon it is not set down the president's message the queen's speech have not mentioned it and yet it is never nothing every thought which genius and piety throw into the world alters the world the gladiators in the lists of power feel through all their frocks of force and simulation the presence of worth i think the very strife of trade and ambition are confession of this divinity and successes in those fields are the poor amens the fig leaf with which the shamed soul attempts to hide its nakedness i find the like unwilling homage in all quarters it is because we know how much is due from us that we are impatient to show some petty talent as a substitute for worth we are haunted by a conscience of this right to grandeur of character and are false to it but each of us has some talent can do somewhat useful or graceful or formidable or amusing or lucrative that we do as an apology to others and to ourselves for not reaching the mark of a good and equal life but it does not satisfy us whilst we thrust it on the notice of our companions it may throw dust in their eyes but does not smooth our own brow or gives us the tranquillity of the strong when we walk abroad <clears throat> we do penance as we go our talent is a sort of expiation and we are constrained to reflect on our splendid moment with a certain humiliation as somewhat too fine and not as one act of many acts a fair expression of our permanent energy most persons of ability meet in society with a kind of tacit ap appeal each seems to say i am not all here senators and presidents have climbed so high with pain enough not because they think the place specially agreeable but as an apology for real worth and to vindicate their manhood in our eyes this conspicuous chair is their com compensation to themselves 
for being of a poor cold hard nature they must do what they can like one class of forest animals they have nothing but a prehensile tail climb they must or crawl if a man found himself so rich natured that he could enter into strict relations with the best persons and make life serene around him by the dignity and sweetness of his behavior could he afford to circumvent the favor of the caucus and the press and covet relations so hollow and pompous as those of a politician surely nobody would be a charlatan who could afford to be sincere the tendencies of the times favor the idea of self-government and leave the individual for all code to the rewards and penalties of his own constitution which work with more energy than we believe whilst we depend on artificial restraints the movement in this direction has been very marked in modern history much has been blind and discreditable but the nature of the revolution is not affected by the vices of the revolters for this is a purely moral force it was never adopted by any party in history neither can be it separates the individual from all party and unites him at the same time to the race it promises a recognition of higher rights than those of personal freedom or the security of property a man has a right to be employed to be trusted to be loved to be revered the power of love as the basis of a state has never been tried we must not imagine that all things are lapsing into confusion if every tender protestant be not compelled to bear his part in certain social conventions nor doubt that roads can be built letters carried and the fruit of labor secured when the government of force is at an end are our methods now so excellent that all competition is hopeless could not a nation of friends even devise better ways on the other hand let not the most conservative and timid fear anything from a premature surrender of the bayonet and the system of force for according to the order of nature which is quite superior to our will it stands thus there will always be a government of force where men are selfish and when they are pure enough to abjure the code of force they will be wise enough to see how these public ends of the post office of the highway of commerce and the exchange of property of museums and libraries of institutions of art and science can be answered we live in a very low state of the world and pay unwilling tribute to governments founded on force there is not among the most religious and instructed men of the most religious and civil nations a reliance on the moral sentiment and a sufficient belief in the unity of things to persuade them that society can be maintained without artificial restraints as well as the solar system or that the private citizen might be reasonable and a good neighbor without the hint of a jail or a confiscation what is strange too there never was in any man sufficient faith in the power of rectitude to inspire him with the broad design of renovating the state on the principle of right and love all those who have pretended this design have been partial reformers and have admitted in some manner the supremacy of the bad state i do not call to mind a single human being who has steadily denied the authority of the laws on the simple ground of his own moral nature such designs full of genius and full of fate as they are are not entertained except avowedly as air pictures if the individual who exhibits them dare to think them practicable he disgusts scholars and churchmen and men of talent and women of superior sentiments cannot hide their contempt not the less does nature continue to fill the heart of youth with suggestions of this enthusiasm and there are now men if indeed i can speak in the plural number more exactly i will say i have just been conversing with one man to whom no weight of adverse experience will make it for a moment appear impossible impossible that thousands of human beings might exercise toward each other the grandest and simplest sentiments 
as well as a knot of friends or a pair of lovers.